Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, topic on financial statement analysis and the learning module on analyzing balance sheets. Sometimes the institute is subtle, sometimes the institute is not so subtle in identifying important testable concepts within a learning module and even within an entire topic area. I'm not sure which it is in this reading. Let me tell you what I'm thinking here. In that very first paragraph, we are told that as good financial analysts, we ought to be able to evaluate a company's liquidity and profitability and operations. And to do that, we of course can use the traditional evaluation of the balance sheet accounts and then the subsequent ratio analysis, which is a focus at the bottom third or so of this learning module. But then the Institute says, we need to worry about intangible assets. We need to think about things like copyrights. We need to think about things like goodwill and how those intangible assets, which by the way, are super difficult to uh, measure and quantify, how those intangible assets can impact the ratios. Now, when you look at the 15 problems at the end of this learning module, you'll see that about the last two thirds of them are ratio questions. But most of them are, let's go ahead and calculate the ratio or let's go ahead and interpret the ratio. But the middle section of this module is a focus on intangible assets. And so we're told that we need to be able to extract the value of those intangible assets and recompute the ratios so that we have a better understanding of the physical assets and the ability of the firm to generate sustainable operating cash flow. Now, the reason I was a little confused about whether or not I'm hit over the head with a feather or a rock is that the Institute doesn't ask us to do that mathematically with intangible assets, but asks us to do this from a non-quantitative perspective. So on the exam, look for some good ratio calculation questions, but then look for some questions about intangible assets and how they change in value over time. All right, so let's go ahead with that knowledge. Look at the LOSs. Notice that we've got four action verbs explaining tangible assets. Whoops, sorry about that. Intangible assets, goodwill. Then we'll look at some financial securities, very short conversation on non-current liabilities. And then we'll end with common size balance sheet and financial ratios. And those are the traditional financial ratios. All right, begin with intangible assets. I'm guessing that you know this, patents, licenses, trademarks, uh, non-monetary, but I think the most important part of the definition is what comes next after the comma there, has no physical substance, right? If we're Milton Hershey, what do we have? We have all these chocolate making machines, but a patent, you can't really look at it. You know, a license, I mean, a trademark, you could see a trademark, but you know, you can't really uh, pick it up and hold on to it. So a, no, a non-physical substance. And the last part is important. It's able to be identified. Now, the Institute is fully aware that we have this uh, U.S. Financial Accounting Standards Board and we have this international Financial Reporting Status uh, Standards Board. And what these two, what these two groups, they want to agree on everything. You know, they pretty much have an idea that, you know what, we're getting closer and closer and closer so that we should have one standard. However, you know, there are little odds and ends uh, over which they don't agree today. And perhaps they'll, perhaps they'll never agree. So we need to know as good financial analysts and as good test preparers, we need to go ahead and know the difference. So what are we doing? So look down at the very bottom. U.S. GAAP, remember, this permits the cost model only, but the international people, they allow the cost model or the revaluation model. Now, you ought, they ought to put the revaluation model in parentheses because you can only use that if there is an active secondary market for the intangible asset. So think about, it. is there an active market for patents? <laughs> and well, the government gives these things. Is there an active market for licenses? Well, no, the government gives these things. Is there an active, now, I mean, secondary market for trademark? So there's probably not, uh, there's probably not an active market for the intangible asset. So I would remember that just as a sentence that might help you on the exam. Now we, 
need to make certain that we can identify these intangibles. So they're split into, you know, kind of two categories, research phase and development phase. So let's remember the easy one. Under US GAAP, both types, research and development phases, these are expensed as occurred. And then we put this here in the slide, except for certain legal costs. And boy, I really read this uh, learning module uh, several times to kind of come up with some examples of those certain legal costs, but there's nothing mentioned in there. I even did a search and uh, I couldn't come up with anything that I could report. So I'm guessing that the accept certain legal costs, that's probably, uh, probably not important as a testable topic. But then under the international rules, under the research phase, um, all those costs are expensed, but in the development phase, some of them may be capitalized if these conditions have been met. Technical feasibility, that at some point we're going to complete it, we're gonna sell or use this particular product, future economic benefits, you know, from a financial analyst standpoint, that's probably the most important of these because what are we trying to do? You know, we invest in wealth increasing projects that generate sustainable cash flows. So we make all these investments in research and development, and we're hoping to get something out of it in the future. And what is that something out of it? That something out of it is operating cash flows. Of course, we need adequate resources and we need to be able to measure these kinds of things. Now, if we acquire or purchase these intangibles, which we can, right? Uh, these are always capitalized on the balance sheet. So they look an awful lot like, you know, the investment in the machinery or equipment. Now we need to make sure we understand the difference between finite and indefinite life uh, intangibles here. So finite useful life, we can amortize these. We review, we review those every year because we may have to impair them. And by the way, from a, an accounting standpoint, that impairment principle is really fascinating because you know, you look at, you look at a machine and you know, that machine is going to lose value over time because it's chugging away and chugging away. Right. And so you have a depreciation expense that shows up over on the balance sheet. But what about a copyright or a trademark? You know, it's not chugging along. It's not losing any value because, right, it's a non-physical asset. But of course, that intangible asset can lose value over time, just like, just like a physical asset can lose value over time. That's why we have in bolded there similar to property, plant, and equip equipment. If there's an indefinite useful life, we, uh, we can't amortize it. Um, we'll have to test for impairment on an annual basis. And then we, uh, we need to keep reviewing whether that, that, uh, indefinite lifetime assumption is, uh, is reasonable. Now costs that are always expensed under both of these uh, internally generated brands and mastheads, you know, uh, I, I love telling you guys all the time to read the Wall Street Journal every day. You know, the masthead, that's, that's kind of a term used, I think, exclusively for newspapers and news organizations. Um, I have no idea how much value, what an, what a, uh, an intangible asset the Wall Street Journal has from its editorial page, but you heard me say this before. I mean, I laugh once or twice out loud reading the editors because they are super smart and they have a tremendous sense of humor and they have a great way of presenting the English language. But I always, uh, I also have my dictionary nearby because I learn vocabulary words. So that masthead, I'm not quite sure how the Wall Street Journal reports that, uh, as an identifiable, uh, intangible asset. Uh, let's see, redundancy costs, relocation, advertising, administration, startup training costs. I mean, they sound, they sound an awful lot like what I teach my students. I just, and this is my finance class. I just call them, those are operating costs and I don't ever distinguish between and among all this kind of stuff, but you might have to, you might have to on the exam. So let's go ahead and look through a quick example here. We have two ongoing projects, hydrogen fuel cells. It's in the research phase, no working prototype. Project two, new catalytic converter. That's in the development stage and there is a working prototype. Ah, 
So I'm guessing that those of you who are movie fans said, oh, wouldn't it be awesome if Doc and Marty had this in Back to the Future Part 3? They needed a new catalytic converter. All right, so here we have Project 1 and we have Project 2. So the question is, where do these things, where do these accounts, where do these costs show up? Should they be capitalized and show up over on the balance sheet or should they be expensed and show up over uh, on the income statement? Well, project one, this is super easy, right? We said this before that the, the two groups, they agree on this. So notice these are all expensed for that project one, which was in the research phase. But project two, which is a little bit different, this development stage and a working prototype. Now look, the administrative costs and the depreciation costs, you should know this from previous and other learning modules, that's thrown over on the, the income statement. Of course, depreciation expense and those administrative costs. However, materials, equipment, and patent costs, those can show up over on the balance sheet and be capitalized. Notice down at the bottom, we have a teardrop point. Remember, overhead and depreciation always expense. Now, let me give you just a quick example. Suppose I'm Jim's mulching company and I have a pretty good reputation uh, and I, I have good machinery, I have good supply chain. So my mulch comes out and it's beautiful, right? And I advertise that my mulch keeps its substance keeps its girding, whatever that means, keeps its color for a lot longer than the competition. But I also have, I have uh, my lead landscaping artist is someone I'll just call her Betty. And Betty has a way, she has an artistic ability. She has a way of looking at the landscaping possibilities and she does all this great stuff. She fluffs up the mulch, she puts it in the right spots. Uh, customers rave over Betty. They say, boy, Betty, you know, this is awesome. Uh, they tell their neighbors, they tell their golf courses, they tell, you know, so we're, I mean, our, our business is doing great. And it's because of my machinery and it's because of Betty and her reputation. Well, is Betty an intangible asset for Jim's mulching company? Absolutely. However, however, that's boy, it's non-monetary. We really can't put our fingers on it. But what happens if some big mulching company over here takes me over. And suppose my market value is like $100 and this big mulching company takes me over and pays $200 for my company. Well, part of that's gonna go to Goodwill and part of that is gonna go to Betty because she is so talented as a mulching artist. All right, so that's Goodwill. So look at the definition. Purchase price of a company exceeds the acquirer's interest in fair value, whatever that means. You know, uh, this simply means that, and you'll learn this when we get to our mergers and acquisitions uh, learning modules in level one and in level two, that the average, uh, per, uh, the average takeover premium in the merger and ac acquisition market is 50%. So you think about that. This is tons of Goodwill, all right? All right, two types. So let me show you here. There's economic goodwill and there's accounting goodwill. This is probably a good exam question. So economic goodwill, intangible elements making a business more valuable than the sum of the tangible assets and liabilities. Boy, brand recognition, customer loyal, employee morale. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like Betty? Notice it's not recorded on the balance sheet, but it will be recognized as accounting goodwill if the big mulching company takes, uh, takes me over. Now, you ready for the coolest part of this whole story? So this big mulching company takes me over and I stay, I stay and I keep working. And there's a, an assignment of goodwill for, uh, for this transaction. And then Betty says, you know what? I don't like working for the big mulching company. I'm leaving. I'm going to start my own mulching company. Oh my gosh. So you have Betty that was responsible for a large part of that goodwill. She leaves well, what's gonna happen? Word of mouth goes down, reputation. So we need this impairment, you know, impairment losses are charged against those current earnings and, and the total assets. Of course, they, they have to be disclosed. So I, I think this might be a really good example for you on the exam when you're thinking about intangible assets. Just, just, think, of, uh, just think of Betty and how awesome she was to my business, Jim's Mulching Company. And then uh, when she leaves, there's an impairment. 
Now, I think I said this in the in my opening remarks. Goodwill comes with a fair amount of management judgments. So, you know, here we have, we have we have the accountants, we have the financial analysts, we have the lawyers, we have you know whoever else is involved. Maybe the government. We have uh, you know maybe uh, maybe uh, somebody from other countries, maybe from uh, someone from other planets come in and say, you know what, this is what we think. So once we decide, once we decide on this number for an intangible asset goodwill, well, then we need to figure out what it means to the larger floor of the New York Stock Exchange, right? So big mulch company takes over Jim's mulching company and it's competing with the Pacific Mulching Company. So these two companies now are trading on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Boy, we need to figure out how can we make a fair comparison of these two companies. So look at that third bullet point there. This is what I was saying earlier about the feather or the rock. So analysts often remove the impact of goodwill for a better comparison. Wow. What that means then, is it going to change total assets? Yes. Is it going to change equity? Yes. Is it going to change some kind of income on the income statement? Well, the answer is yes, if we have, if we have impairment. So I think, I think this is under the word of caution there. I think this is more of a non quantitative question versus uh, let's go ahead and remove them and make a comparison on the exam. All right, let's move on to financial instruments here. What do we know? Corporations, they can be just like us. They can go to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and they can buy shares of stock in companies. They can buy bonds. They can do whatever they want to with their cash as long as they disclose it and they tell their shareholders uh, what they're going to do. But it's not limited to New York Stock Exchange or treasury bonds or corporate bonds. I mean, they can invest in derivatives for a variety of reasons, most of which ought to be hedging uh, loans and receivables. All right, so historical cost, fair value, or amortized cost, depending on the classification. So let's go ahead and memorize this slide. So equity securities measured at fair value, available for sales securities, they're measured at fair value. Trading debt securities are measured at fair value. And then the held to maturity. All right, so these held, these securities that we think we're going to hold to maturity, we measure those at cost, all right? But then what we need to do is we also need to figure out where those gains go. So equity securities, income statement, debt securities, income statement, and then the available for sales, they go over in the OCI. All right, so that's an important distinction. Now, those of you who pay attention to the Wall Street Journal, you pay attention to regional banks who failed in the year 2022 and 2023, you might be aware that some of these financial institutions, they decided to hold securities that were available for sale, but put them in the holding to maturity category and vice versa. And they do this for a variety of reasons. So. Remember, it's up to the management's discretion of how to identify them as available for sale or held to maturity. Of course, uh, there's various implications for interest rate risk. Those are conversations for a different day. So just remember this slide. Actually, get your phone out and take a picture of this slide. That'll probably, uh, that'll probably help you. You have your phone out. Go ahead and take a picture of this slide. The international standards. Um, so at amortized costs, there's the held to maturity debt securities measured at fair value. Those are debt securities and equity securities, and then uh, measured at fair value. And but through through the profit and loss. So remember back here, we went through that other comprehensive income for the available for sales. We do that over here in that middle for debt and equity securities. Non-current liabilities, these are typically sound an awful lot like, you know, bank loans or bond issues. So the initial measurement, they're recognized at fair value. But then we need to worry about those amortized costs. Remember in your, uh, in your very first financial accounting class, you had conversations about bonds that are issued at premiums or discounts, and you had to go ahead and record the journal entry for the, uh, amortization of the bond premium or the bond discount. Now, of course, you won't have to do a journal entry here, but you'll need to know how it impacts the financial statements. So we've come up with just uh, two simple examples here. 
So if we issue bonds at par value, there you go, look at the top, there's 10 million. So that's a long-term liability of 10 million. The amortized cost is going to be 10 million and that will show up all the way through maturity. But if we issue them at a discount, say uh, 97.5, what happens then is that we have to amortize that $250,000 discount over the bond's life and there are some accounting rules that allow you to do this over that time period. You probably won't have to uh, compute that. I would guess the Institute would give you that amount. But notice down at the bottom there, that's still reported as a liability of $10 million because that's what the firm owes. Now remember that sometimes a firm presents financial statements for one person and presents a different set of financial statements for another person. And this one person over here might be the government and this other person over here might be you and I as regular old investors. And so inevitably there are going to be differences between important uh, accounts in those two sets of financial statements. Uh, the great example of this is depreciation. Maybe the firm uses accelerated depreciation for the government so that it pays a lower tax liability, and maybe it uses uh, straight line depreciation to report to uh, the regular old investment investors. Well, that means that when that sh uh, accelerated depreciation method reverts, then we're going to have to pay more taxes uh, in the future. And so look at the very bottom. That's a deferred tax liability is set up because we know we get the tax break today and we know that we're going to have a non-tax break in the future. And of course this works. I mean, depreciation is the great example, but it also works in the same fashion for amortization, what we've been talking about and depletion of natural resources. Now let's go ahead and ask ourselves the question. Let's go back to my example. So here's the big mulch company and over here's the Pacific mulch company, but the big mulch company is worth 500 and the Pacific mulch company is worth 300. So how do we go ahead and try to make some kind of an evaluation for comparison purposes of 500 versus 300? You know, is bigger always better? Maybe it is, but sometimes it's not. All right, so this is what we come up with this, this, this common size balance sheet. Notice the second teardrop point. We're doing this for analytical purposes. This is not an accounting requirement. What we can do is we can do this vertically or we can do this horizontally. Let's go ahead and look at Nike here. So all we're doing is making, turning these things into ratios. So cash and cash equivalents, whatever that number is, it's 26.64% of total assets at the bottom. Notice total assets are 100%. So with the common size balance sheet and income statement as well, it allows for us to take a look at a couple of things that we typically can't see, at least at this subtle level. We can compare big mulch company with the Pacific mulch company, but this is important here. We can also do a trend analysis for both of those com companies. It's one thing to say, okay, big mulch is at 22%, Pacific is at 27%, but that let's look at the trends in both of them. I mean, they might come up with the same common size percentage. Let's say they're both at 26.64 for cash and cash equivalents, and we're trying to evaluate the liquidity of these two companies. But, but if we look at the trend in the common size over the last five years, maybe big mulch is trending this way and maybe uh, Pacific mulch is trending the other way. I'm guessing that you guys figure out that I just did some mulching in my, uh, in my, in my yard. All right, how about this last one here? Uh, financial ratios. Uh, this is what the, uh, the reading emphasizes. Liquidity ratios. Remember, liquidity is how quickly we can turn an asset into cash. And it's not because we're interested in just hoarding cash, but we have all of these things that are coming due over on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. So liquidity measures our ability to meet those short-term obligations like all of the accounts payable. So we have a current ratio. That's easy. Current assets over current liabilities. 
cash ratio. That's easy. We just have cash and marketable securities because those marketable securities, those are super, super easy to turn into cash. Now, comma, I'm going to say a comma and put this in parentheses. It depends on, it depends on how we classified those things back in the slide. What was that? Four or five slides ago. And then we can do a quick ratio where we can do the cash and the marketable securities and the receivables. So we're kind of taking out inventory. You know, so there's a unique indication on that right hand column, but essentially these three ratios tell us how easy is it for us to meet our short term obligations. But note that the current ratio, it includes inventory, quick and cash do not quick ratio includes receivables. So remember we had a conversation in a previous recording on factoring accounts receivables. So we can sell, we can sell those accounts receivables. So think about the difference between the quick and the cash ratio. That's a good exam question about factoring. Solvency ratios, on the other hand, they ask the question that how quickly can we turn our assets into cash? And now wait a minute, how quickly can we turn our assets into cash so we can meet our long-term obligations? This is called so long-term solvency. Now, now the part of this is how quickly can we turn our assets, our product lines, into operating cash flows? You know, so that's kind of the the backdrop of these solvency ratios. A lot of times people call these leverage ratios, so long-term debt to equity or just debt to equity. How about total debt, which is total debt over total assets and then financial leverage. So what are the indications over there? They tell us, hey, how much debt does the firm have in its capital structure? A firm has this much debt, has very little threat of insolvency or bankruptcy. A firm has that has this much debt has a bigger chance of bankruptcy or insolvency. However, we need to put them in uh, numerators and denominators so we get them in relative terms. So let's take a look at a quick example. Uh, let's compute some ratios there and notice that we have just general accounts here, total current, total non-current. So we can go ahead and compute these ratios. So the current ratio in 2020 was 144, current ratio in 2021, 140. Uh, what do we want to say about the liquidity? Well, clearly this this Prudential, they, they have tons of uh, current assets. 1.4 is fine. The difference between 1.44 and 1.40 is probably completely immaterial. The issue becomes when we get closer to 1, you know, if you drop below 1, that means your current liabilities are exceed the current assets. And so this is where we start worrying about, we start worrying about short-term insolvency. But remember, we've had great conversations that inside of working capital management, lots of firms have, lots of big brand name firms like Johnson & Johnson, uh, they have current ratios that are less than one. Now, does that mean that they're insolvent? And the answer, of course, is no. But what they do is they just layer their volatile cash flows. When they have low cash flows, they just issue commercial paper. And so my advice is to look at these two ratios, 144 to 140. The Institute, and this is what we have at the top, the Institute is probably want you to say something like, you know what, it has not improved. I'm not sure we can say that it has deteriorated. Uh, if I'm creating this question, I would have put some numbers there that in 2020, that would have been 144. And then in 2021, I would have said something like 1.04. Oh boy, that's a drastic reduction in liquidity. So then we probably have to worry about liquidity. Total debt ratio, uh, 2020 was 67.2 and now it's 67.0. What are we saying? That it's reliance on debt financing pretty much hasn't changed. The Institute wants us to say something like it has not reduced its reliance on debt financing. So here's the idea that our, our product lines are generating lots and lots of cash. We can make our interest payments, but then we can also reduce the principal payment in the bank loan or the bond issue. And we, we haven't done that. And that takes us through these LOSs. 
what sounded like a really dull learning module turns out to be at least fairly interesting. Go ahead and nod your head if you agree that this was fairly, uh, fairly interesting. Those of you who are accountants, you are probably doing uh, high fives and handstands um, uh, behind your desk. Anyway, I want you to go to those 15 problems at the end of the learning module. You'll need your calculator. You won't need your financial calculator, but you'll have to do a bunch of ratios and you'll have to explain and interpret I'm guessing you can do those in under in under 20 minutes. Hey, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Go mulch your front yard. And uh, hey, good luck studying.